Hello everyone and welcome to CubeTube. Today we are going to talk about another element and this time the element is going to be 106 Seaborgium. So let's open it up and see what we've got here. We have an acrylic cube and oh my dear. Here we go. Again, it's a placeholder. Now, for some of you that are getting tired of these placeholders, let's start off immediately with the following question. And the question is, is it money well spent on, uh, on elements at the end of the periodic table? Because it seems to be a little bit of a waste, right? If you can only, if you cannot really create the elements in such a way that they are, yeah, that they are stable, why would you do this? Isn't this just a waste of money? Well, we'll get back to that at the uh, at the end of the video. Um, but for now, just uh, just think about it. Maybe you can come up with your own um, your own ideas. So. Let's go to the properties. So the properties that we got here is that it's uh, it's named SG. Those are num uh, that's those are the letters. Well, it's called Seaborgium. Very interesting. It has an atomic mass of two sixty six, and it is element one hundred and six. So let's put it up here, and there we go. So. What else can I tell you about this? Well, there's 17 different isotopes with half-life ranging from 9.3 milliseconds to 14 minutes. And since the 14 minutes is still too short to put it in a cube, then send it over to uh, uh, the Netherlands, the country where I live, and then, um, yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. So this is why they put a placeholder in there. Um, due position in the periodic table, it's likely that it has similar properties to elements such as chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten. It's a very unstable element, as mentioned before, because the half times are uh, 9.3 microseconds or, uh, or 14 minutes. And yeah, so it's also very, very radioactive. So I think the placeholder does tell you the story of what's going on with this element. <clears throat> so. Um, Seaborgium SG was first synthesized in 1974 at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California by bombarding Californium-249 with oxygen-18 ions. Now this is a complex process that requires a precise conditions and advanced equipment. And highlighting these achievements of the modern nuclear chemistry. Scientists from US and Russia uh, did this around the same time, but since one, uh, some of the experiments have, uh, have already taken place um, in the US before 1974, the US scientists were ultimately given the credit. And when you get this credit, you get to name the element. And this is of course what everybody wants to do, because who wouldn't want to name a uh, chemistry element or an element from the periodic table? Well, they wanted to name it after the scientist Glenn T. Seaborg. But the International Union of Applied Chemistry basically decided like, yeah, no, we're not going to do this. And why? They rejected this request at first because an element was never named until then after a living scientist. So he would be the first. And they said, well, there is a protocol that basically says that you cannot do this. However, upon reviewing the protocols, it turned out that there was no such protocol. Uh, there wasn't a rule that stated that elements couldn't be named after uh, after uh, living people. So that's why it was called Seaborgium, after Glenn T. Seaborg. Now, fun fact about name-giving elements is that both Enrico Fermi and Albert Einstein were alive when it was proposed to name an element after them. But they had passed away, unfortunately, by the time it was finally done. And this also tells you a little bit about the process of naming elements. It can sometimes, or at least reviewing the experiments, it can sometimes take a very long time before elements actually get their name. Now, Glenn T. Seaborg, who was he? Well, he was an American chemist and physicist who, along with, res with his research team, was responsible for the discovery of many elements. Plutonium, americinium, curium, berkelium. Californium, Einsteinium, Fermium, Mendelevium, Nobelium, 
And finally, element 106, which was named after him, Seaborgium. Now, Glenn T. Seaborg also contributed to the Manhattan Project, the creation of the first atomic bomb during World War II. Because, as you could see, plutonium was one of the things that he, um, he basically created for the first time. And that was also one of the uh, elements that they used for making one of the first atomic bombs. And actually, one of the first tests was done by, with plutonium. Now, what are the purposes of Seaborgium? Well, I cannot think of anything right now uh, of an application of the actual element. So what do we do with it? Well, to verify the properties, experiments are conducted where atoms of Seaborgium, which exist for a very short time, as you saw earlier, are attached to, for instance, other uh, molecules or elements, such as carbon monoxide molecules to form a molecule that can exist longer. So this is something that you can do. Ah, it's not existing for a very long time. Let's combine it, make a molecule, and then see if it exists longer. It's a cool experiment. Um, by doing this, um, you can then, if you have something that, for instance, lasts for a couple of days, you can test things and see if it has the same properties as, for instance, tungsten, which is in the same period. Um, research do this to basically verify uh, if Seaborgium has the same properties. Now, why do we do this since you cannot use uh, yeah, Seaborgium and you cannot really make it a stable element? Well, what does it matter whether it has the same properties? Well, ultimately, these type of experiments are just a piece of a larger puzzle. By verifying these theories and properties, we will be better at understanding how molecules and atoms interact with each other. Now, that's the point of such experiments. No, for Seaborgium itself, it's not necessarily a useful element. But for the bigger picture of physics and the periodic table, these experiments can be extremely valuable. Now, these experiments that mostly are being conducted with transuranium elements, basically all the elements after uranium, are done to figure out more about the nucleus, the core of the element. And, well, more than, we do that more, and that is more physics than actual chemistry, and to find out those chemical properties. But while you actually create them, you can do these experiments anyway, just to see what's it, what, it, what it brings to you. Now, there is also a theory that states that in the vast field of unknown elements, there is an isle of stability. Now, what do I mean, the vast field of unknown elements? Well, we have tennessine here, 117, right? After that, there is one more element, which is called Ioganesson. Now, after that, there's probably much more elements. And the theory believes that there is a bunch of elements after that, which could be much more stable than these elements, which can only last for a couple of milliseconds. Now, that's what they're trying to figure out in, in the past, let's say, 20 to 40 years. Now, if such an island would exist, probably one of the application would likely be maybe a new kind of bomb. So, who knows whether it's a good idea to basically invent that. Now, to get back to the question, is it a waste of money uh, to spend... Um, is it a waste of money to spend it on research for elements that don't have any applications? Well, you know what? I would say, no, it's not a waste of money. Yes, I love science, so I probably think that any experiment is worth doing. But, like I mentioned, before most of the time when scientists are working on projects like this, the outcome and applications are unknown. Also, more specifically, when Investigating the behavior of molecules, as explained in this, in this episode, we learn more about whole groups of elements that we, are, that we have already discovered. So no, I would not consider this spending, uh, I wouldn't consider spending money on this, uh, on new elements, a waste of money. Because, well, in the end, it's a good idea to learn about how the world works. And we still know so very little about well, think uh, the whole uh, the whole chemistry in general. So that was the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. If you liked the episode, click the like button and subscribe. Um, if you think I've missed something about uh, Glenn T. Seaborg or Seaborgium, 
leave leave your comments in the comments see you next week